the son of Sam, Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, endless volumes of books dedicated to serial killers. But what about Canadian serial killers? It seems like an American phenomenon, but uh, we have our own grisly history when it comes to this uh, most heinous of crimes. What makes a serial killer? Why do they do what they do? Lee Mellor is the author of Cold North Killers, Canadian Serial Murder. He joins me now. Good morning. Good morning, Tommy. It's a very chilling uh, topic. Uh, what made you decide to uh, focus on this? Well, actually, I was going to write a, a mystery novel, and mm -hmm. uh, I was writing it about a profiler for the RCMP, uh, who I just came up with, and I had to come up with some bad guys for him to chase. So I started coming up with these bad guys, which was a really fun process, and then I realized, I, wait, I only know about three Canadian serial killers at the time. It would have been Bernardo, Olson, and Picton, and there's got to be more than that. I mean, as peaceful and you know, nice it is to live here. I can't believe there's only three. So I started digging just to make sure that I didn't copy, uh, you know, a crime that had happened in real life. And then I unearthed, uh, well, there's 60 in the book, but I've unearthed about 80. So what surprised you most as, as you started doing this research? You're right. I would have also guessed that there'd be a mere handful. What surprised you most about Canadian serial killers? I think just uh, really how little attention they've had. I mean, even here in Montreal, we've had this guy, William Fife, killed nine women that we know of, uh, possibly more. But uh, no one in uh, Canada has really heard of this guy. I mean, that's a, a pretty large number, is nine women. Uh, I think just the fact that uh, they've gone unnoticed this long. And as, you, as you're reading the stuff and doing the research about them, what did you find that they they had in, in common? Like, take us inside the mind of a serial killer. Based on your research, uh, what, what do they have in, in, in common? Well, I guess pure mm -hmm. uh, road to becoming a serial killer is, I guess, like becoming a radio host. You know, you can arrive there many different paths, but there is sort of uh, things that they do share in, in common for, the, you know, the, the majority of them. And one of those things is fantasy. Uh, that is aberrant fantasy. So they'll kind of hang out in this place uh, psychologically where they'll be constantly thinking about uh, dominating other people, tying them up, hurting them. And uh, if this starts at a young age, then it uh, kind of fuses with their sexuality as they mature. And so they never really know what it's like to be normal uh, sexually or socially uh, because they kind of live in this fantasy world where they're constantly hurting people. Now, a lot of the time this is triggered by trauma, like maybe they're neglected by their mom and dad or beaten or teased at school, whatever. But the fantasies are a way of them kind of of a powerless person getting revenge. And so their whole being becomes like this power dynamic. Do, do they sense that they're, they're innocent? In other words, they're not doing anything wrong. They're just rectifying something past that was wrong. They're just fi fixing an injustice. Is that how they see themselves? I think the way they see themselves really depends on the individual and uh, and how, well, first of all, they're, they're roundly psychopathic. So they might tell you that, you know, what I, yeah, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but they don't necessarily feel it. They're repeating something that they've heard. Uh, they may legally realize that it's wrong, but uh, they they don't care. It's that simple. They just don't care. And if they're psychopath, that means they they feel no they feel no sympathy or empathy or compassion at all for their victims at any point. Uh, not the, not in the way that we would. Uh, I, to say that they feel no empathy, it would kind of undermine some of the crimes that they did. For instance, if you have somebody who's sexually sadistic, they get off on torturing people. If they're not realizing the pain that that person's feeling. How are they achieving the gratification from doing it? So they have to realize that they're causing pain to these people. Um, so it's not that they're without uh, at the ability to know what somebody else is feeling. It's maybe they just don't care. The book is called Cold North Killers, Canadian Serial Murder. Lee Mellor is the author. He's my guest, 514-790-0991. If you want to text a question, you can text it to 514-800. Let's look at some of those contemporary examples. Uh, Russell Williams, uh, uh, what the police were saying that they'd never encountered uh, a killer like uh, Russell Williams. Uh, what did you find in, in your research uh, as you looked at his case? Well, I think that to say that they've never encountered a killer like Russell Williams, it's just a little bit naive. Uh, to be honest, if you've researched the topic enough, he he's rare that he started late. Um, he's rare that he accelerated at such a rate. 
Um, it's rare that he achieved such a, a position of authority. But uh, I, I don't really see what is so bizarre about his behavior otherwise. Like he has these paraphilias and the, the way that he operates as a criminal. We, we've seen it all before. It's, I, I don't really, I've never really understood that arg argument about Russell Williams. Having written this book, are you going to still go ahead with your, your novel about the uh, serial killer? I think eventually, uh, I, yeah, I'd like to make a series out of that. But, uh, you know, I, I've got another book coming out on uh, mass murderers and spree killers in Canada after this. I already signed the contract, and I might have to take a little vacation from the topic for a while, yeah. <laughs> to to clear, clear your head about it, 514-790-0991. Star Talk, text your comments to 514-800. The book is called Cold North Killers, Canadian Serial Murder by Lee. A chilling book. It's called Cold North Killers, Canadian Serial Serial Murder by Lee Mellor, 514-790-0991. Some uh, phone calls and text questions uh, coming in. This text question saying, how, um, how was the vampire rapist able to get a day pass enabling him to escape custody at the Contiki in, uh, in Montreal? Okay, so we're speaking about Wayne Bowden, who was a sexual sadist who murdered, I think, three women in the city in 1969-1970. Then he murdered a fourth in, in Calgary and was caught for that one. He was actually the, f the first person in North America, America convicted of bite mark evidence, I believe. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting case. Uh, in answer to the question, the I don't know, judicial incompetence, I don't think these people should be allowed out in day passes at all. And I, I think they should all be automatically labeled dangerous offenders and kept in prison for life. In many cases, they are allowed out. Tell me about one of the ones you mentioned in the book, Peter Woodcock. Yeah, Peter Woodcock, uh, he was uh, a killer at the age of 17 uh, from 1956 to 1957 in Toronto. Uh, this is over about a three-month period. He murdered uh, three children, uh, kind of lured them out to various remote parts of Toronto and beat them and strangled and suffocated them and performed these sort of immature sexual assaults on them. So they put him in Penetanguishene Hospital for years and years and years uh, until 1991, trying to rehabilitate him, electroshock therapy, giving him LSD as if that would help, you know, all these different uh, experimental right. things. 1991, uh, okay, uh, Peter, we're going to finally let you out in your first day pass. He doesn't even get off the grounds. He's already plotted to murder someone else. Um, he murders a fellow patient on the grounds. Uh, there's necrophilia and mutilation involved. Then he just calmly walks into the OPP dispatch covered in blood and turns himself in. Whatever happened to him? Uh, he died, actually, last year. Yeah, I had in, to revise in, the book. Uh, in yeah. prison. Yeah, in the psychiatric hospital. 514-790-0991. Larry on the line. Larry, good morning. The only thing I want to say is that when you're talking about psychopaths, which is the actual word, it's not really sociopaths, according to Robert Hare, um, that he found it contrary to what, and this way you sort of stipulate that people, they go into fantasies because of, because of mistreatment, and they found, no, there's actually a lot of them, and this is the hallmark of psychopaths as opposed to other mental illnesses, you want to say, is that they don't suffer the thing of inadequacy, feeling of like, Anxiety. They're free from that. They're narcissistic braggarts. Whatever they do, they do that. They feel actually very good about themselves. They feel super confident. They're okay. Okay. Is that is that correct? Do they feel super confident? They're narcissistic. Feel confident about themselves. Uh, narcissism is. Uh is part of being diagnosed a psychopath. There's two different wings to it. There's uh, the narcissistic, uh, aggressive narcissism wing, and there's the antisocial personality disorder wing. Uh, so uh, most psychopaths will have, yes, narcissistic qualities. However, the thing about narcissism, it's kind of like these two poles. Uh, a narcissist feels great about themselves, but it's also offset by deep feelings of insecurity at the same time. Now, I think uh, what the guest is talking about is uh, this idea that maybe they don't feel uh, bad about what they did. And there's been some uh, functional MRIs done on the brains of uh, psychopaths, sociopaths, uh, that show that they do not uh, show the same fear responses in the brains. So this is one of the reasons why they might not uh, be uh, as um, deterred from doing what they want to do for that reason. 514-790-0991. Start talk. Text your question or your comment to 514-800. Is this a phenomenon restricted to white males? No, not at all. It's a huge myth. Actually, I believe that uh, the recent studies have shown that uh, per capita, 
uh, African Americans, at least in the United States now, are are more o- are overrepresented slightly in in serial killers. And uh, in Cold North Killers, there's a a Sikh man who's a, a serial killer. There's a I think about three African Canadians, three white women. Yeah, it's um no, not exclusively. Five one four seven nine zero zero nine nine one. John on the line with a question. Good morning. Hello. Yes. Does the list include uh, professional hitmen like for La Mafia and the uh, biker gangs, and also individual sort of single killers like uh, Valerie Fabricant? Okay. The, uh, in the case of Fabricant, you'd be looking at someone who's a mass murderer. That's different than a serial killer in that they uh, kill in a single incident. They don't have a cooling off period. They claim four or more victims in a in a in a single act. Uh, they don't they're not really looking at getting away with their crimes. It's more just sort of like a big boom, you know, going out in fireworks. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the time, people like that are shot. And uh, as uh, in regards to the hitman question, uh, I don't specifically include them uh, in my book. There's some argument about whether they should be included or not. There is a a subcategory of serial killer known as the hedonist comfort killer. And that's a serial killer that kills for material gain. So you'll have women that poison their husbands for insurance, etc. And some people would argue that these kind of contract killers fall into that category. The book is called uh, Cold North Killers, Canadian Serial Murder. Lee Melor, my guest. Uh, got more text questions coming in. Uh, this one says, does your guest think the death penalty should be applied to these people? Uh, no, I don't, actually, because simply... Statistically, we've seen that uh, states in the United States that have the death penalty also tend to have the highest murder rates, so it doesn't deter them. Uh, Also, it's more expensive because of the appeals process, and I'd actually rather see them uh, not get off easy. I mean, death, uh, in my belief system, is is an exit, and uh, I would prefer to see them linger in jail and be forced to work and uh, attack that narcissism to reduce them to a, a simple laborer. Next question, text question, in how many cases are police incompetent? Oh, uh, I, I don't have uh, statistics, but I'd say um, uh, when you get to especially the, a lot of the West Coast cases involving uh, prostitutes and uh, Native Canadian women, un- unfortunately, um, it's not so much an incompetence, it's just uh, what an insouciance. Now, when when you were doing the research for this book, you didn't interview the actual murderers. Is it more difficult to interview them in, in jail in Canada, uh, serial killers, than it is to interview serial killers in the United States? I... Uh... I would think I would think yes. Uh, it's generally harder to get information from police. Uh, I mean, I asked just simply for mug shots from some police. I couldn't. Uh, they wouldn't even go there. The OPP, the RCMP wouldn't do that. Um, I'm thinking unless that you're some some kind of high-ranking psychiatrist, there's there's a, absolutely no chance. I've spoken with enough journalists about trying to get information uh, from police, and now. What about, we talked before about uh, the male codes. What about some of the females, the famous uh, Canadian female serial murderers? Well, there's three. Uh, the most famous probably being Carla Homoka, who is now living a, a nice life in the islands, from what I hear. Um, she was uh, kind of aided Paul Bernardo, who is one of the worst sexual sadists and uh, in Ontario history. And I, I'm sure everyone knows the story of her, got out earlier than she should have came, lived here in Montreal, and uh, there's also Melissa Ann Friedrich. She's our only black widow killer, and uh, that's somebody who I mentioned before uh, who kills their husbands for insurance. Uh, She was from New Brunswick, and she killed her first husband there by uh, doping him up, I think it was with Valium, and then reversing her car over him a few times, and then she played up the whole I'm an incompetent female driver thing and she actually got on some uh, documentary i think it was financed by the national film board about why women kill and she was portrayed as this victim uh, you know of this abusive husband and it turned out later she you know she was let out of prison turns out later she's just a, a psychopath herself and she kills another guy in florida and uh yeah and then, and she's in, in jail since then, right? They caught her for that one, second she, one? Yeah, she went to jail in Florida, but once again uh, got out. And the last I heard, she was uh, being deported back to Canada and facing fraud charges. Um, oh, we'll have to find out more about her. The, yeah. for joining us.